Well, all right then. I guess I don't really have an excuse anymore. So, the character of Nightwing has been becoming more and more popular as of late, and is starting to be seen as one of DC's flagship characters. And yet, as of right now, there don't seem to be any plans for him to be adapted into his own movie. Chris McKay, the director of the Lego Batman movie, has been trying to get one off the ground for years, but because Warner Brothers is, well, Warner Brothers, that doesn't look to be happening anytime soon. The newly retired DC logo literally had him basically at the front and then nothing. Which is a shame, because I love Nightwing. Dick Grayson is one of my favorite superheroes of all time, and I think he deserves an adaptation that can do him justice. He's been a part of tons of incredible animated projects, and we've also got the whole can of worms that is Titans, but I think a feature film showcasing his origin from Robin into Nightwing would be a perfect way to introduce him to more general audiences. And with this new regime at DC, with James Gunn at the helm, who's seemingly focused on building a world showcasing all aspects of the DC universe from a plethora of different directors and styles and voices, I think now is the perfect time for a Nightwing movie. Also, let's be real, it's been rough for Dick Grayson fans lately. Nightwing was one of the select few comic book characters that's been allowed to have long form development. Most of the time, the big A-listers end up getting retconned back to status quo by editorial in an attempt to sell more number ones. But from Acrobat to Robin to a Teen Titan to Nightwing to Batman, even an undercover agent, his growth and his change throughout the years has been a core reasoning for why he's been so loved. And so I would want a Nightwing movie to lean into that to tell a story about change and growth and also about expectations. Living up to the expectations of the people around you, but also the expectations you set on yourself. And a story about becoming your own person and allowing yourself to spread your wings. So this is my pitch for Nightwing. But first, this video is brought to you by AG1. AG1 is a daily foundational nutrition supplement that supports whole body health. It combines the power of multiple supplements like vitamins, probiotics, and whole food source nutrients into just one scoop, making it your simplest daily health habit. I love AG1 because of how easy it is to make. Every morning, I just take a scoop of the powder and mix it with 12 ounces of water, and that's it. And on top of that, it actually tastes pretty good. From looking at it, you wouldn't guess it, but it's surprisingly sweet. It's made out of pineapple and vanilla. It's hard to explain because obviously you can't taste it through the video, but I really like it. And the flavor makes it a lot easier for me to have every day. And because of that, I'm seeing a lot of the benefits like with my energy levels. Many vitamins and minerals are hard for the body to process, but AG1 makes it easy by carefully sourcing the ingredients for absorption, potency, and nutrient density so you can get the most out of your nutrients that you consume. Listen, we all know the holidays are wild. That's what they're known for. And by supporting your immune system to help you stay present with your loved ones, and by supporting stress resilience and mood balance, AG1 is a daily nutritional support to keep you reliably resilient during the holiday season. Head to my link in the description below to get a free one year supply of AG vitamin D3 plus K2, plus five AG1 travel packs with your first purchase of AG1. And thanks so much to AG1 for sponsoring the video. We open in Gotham as a jewelry store is being robbed by masked men. We hear a childish laugh echo through the darkness above as a figure lurks over them before he leaps down into the light. A 12 year old boy wearing a green and red costume and a yellow cape stands before the robbers. They laugh at the boy before he leaps and flips through the air like a trained acrobat and slams a kick into one of the robbers face. A lot of people seem to have trouble grasping the concept of Robin in live action. Either they want to age him up to a fully grown adult or remove all the color from his costume to just make him Batman Jr. They want to write him out of the story entirely or hell, just kill him off before the movie starts. And I can understand why to some people it might seem challenging. He's a literal child dressed in bright colors flipping around while standing next to you your brooding dark night. To a lot of people, the concept could only be done in that overtly campy style. And the idea is so silly and ridiculous that they have to either change it to make it work or constantly poke fun at it. But I don't think that's the case. I actually think that if given the right chance and put into the hands of the right filmmaker, an accurate Robin could be incredible. The silliness and the contrast between him and Batman is what makes their dynamic so special. I mean, hell, it's not like we've never seen kids superheroes kick ass before, literally in a movie called Kick Ass. And it works great. And so here I want to show, even if just for a little bit, that if you take it seriously and treat it with care, Batman and Robin can be cool. The robbers fight off against the young vigilante, but Robin bounces between them all like it's nothing. His agility and smaller size making him a harder target to hit despite the bright colors of his costume. He flips around, uses both his surroundings and his staff, laughing at the robbers and cracking jokes to catch them off guard. And with the robbers defeated, a figure emerges from the shadows above, Batman. The boy looks to his mentor and asks how he did. It's his first night out, less than a year since he was taken in after his parents were killed. And he wants to make a good impression. Batman looks at the boy. Better. A remaining thug attempts to sneak up and attack Robin from behind, but Batman throws a battering, knocking him to the ground. But sloppy. The robber groans on the ground and looks up at the dynamic duo. Who the hell are you? The name's Robin. 
the boy. We hard cut to 10 years later. Dick Grayson, now 22, puts his duffel bag down in his new apartment and sighs. Outside his window is the city of Bloodhaven, about 150 miles east of Gotham. When it comes to the casting of Dick Grayson, I don't really have any specific picks or anything. A lot of people like to just fan cast whatever the most attractive CW dude with dark hair that they can find is, and you know, all power to that. But Dick Grayson in the comics is Romani, at least his mother is. And if you ask me, I think it would be important to try and cast a Romani actor for the role. And with how other notable Romani superheroes have been treated in big adaptations, I don't think it's fair to just outright ignore it or pretend it doesn't exist. Now, I don't personally know of any Romani actors that would fit the role. Obviously, they exist in the world, uh, but I'm not a casting director, and so I don't know them. And honestly, I think an unknown might be better for this role anyway. But also, anyone who gets cast is going to get, like, horrifically body shamed by most of the internet because he's not hot enough or whatever. Uh, and I don't know if I want to put that on anyone. Honestly, now that I say that, I'm kind of surprised I made it this far without making a joke about Nightwing's ass. Wait, that doesn't count, does it? But I like the idea of casting two different actors for Dick Grayson. One for the present day as Nightwing in his 20s, but also one for the flashback sequences. Dick Grayson's history as Robin is too important to just be talked about off screen, and it could open doors for other stories set earlier in his career to expand on that. Also, I'm just gonna say it. Give him the mullet, goddammit. I grew up my hair for like nine months specifically for this video. Please, James Gunn, don't make that a waste. Also, I'm gonna say the word dick a lot. I'm sorry, it's his name. YouTube, please don't get mad at me. Make all your jokes in the comments. Get it over with. I, I, I can't do it. As Dick unpacks into his new place, he's on the phone with Barbara Gordon, the original Batgirl who retired after being paralyzed. As the two talk, we get some extra context as to what happened in the past 10 years and the reason why Dick moved away. I admit, 10 years might be a little long. Uh, the canon timeline keeps on changing and it doesn't really make any sense. But in my head, 10 just it feels like the right number for some reason. And while I would prefer we have Dick as Robin for a few movies before this to build out his relationship with Bruce and including their falling out, at the same time, I'm kind of sick of the whole trend of like having to wait three to five movies for the character that I like to be the character. And I'd honestly rather we throw us right in the middle of everything and use context and flashbacks to figure things out. All we know is that Dick and Bruce are not on good terms right now. To Barbara and Alfred, it feels like it came out of the blue, but for Dick, this has been building for a while. Things started out fine back in the day, but the last couple of years, ever since he turned 18, it started to go downhill quick. The fight the arguments, the trust issues, and all in all, just feeling completely unappreciated by Bruce. Honestly, when you think about it, this is almost like a sequel to Batman and Robin. Take that how you will. And so he's decided to leave and make it on his own here in Bloodhaven to prove to Bruce that he's better than him, better than Batman. He opens up one of the bags and we see the Robin costume. We cut to the roof of the Bloodhaven Police Department. Detective Renee Montoya looks out at the snowy city skyline. I think it'd be really fun to have this movie set around New Year's, not just because snow is always just a fun backdrop for a superhero movie, but also the feeling of wanting to change and be better. You know, the New Year new me thing that works really well for Nightwing. Also, so I can justify this video coming out so late into the year, Montoya's just been transferred out of Gotham and sent to Bloodhaven, not by choice. On the surface, it seems quieter. The lights are brighter, the streets are cleaner, but she knows that there's a deeper evil beneath the surface that nobody wants to address. I really like the city of Bloodhaven in the comics because nobody's ever really given it a definitive personality, as opposed to Gotham, which has been a lot more fleshed out. And that's allowed for different writers and artists to try their hand and always bring something new to the table. Some people just make it a ripoff of Gotham, but I really like what Sam Humphreys did in his limited time on the book and turned it into a casino town. Bright neon lights covering up the suffering and the corruption with a coat of paint. Gotham, at the very least, has the decency to wear it all on its sleeve. That book's really good, by the way. I, I, it's like, it's like, he's on it for like four issues, four, for like, like a single arc, but it's really good. <laughs> and making the city different from Gotham, both from the Gotham City in this universe, plus all the other Gothams we've seen in the past, helps to not only diversify the universe, but also throws Dick and the audience into what feels like an entirely new world and show how scary it can be to do that all on your own. For decades, Bloodhaven used to be a fishing town. The docks used to be a main source of income and livelihood for the people. They went out to sea, did their job, came back home and lived happy lives. But that all changed around 50 years ago when the Desmonds came to town. Mark Desmond framed himself as a simple businessman, trying to set up his casino in Bloodhaven and make a name for himself. When in reality, he started a crime ring that's held the city in shackles for years. They called him Blockbuster, not just because of his immense strength, but because he bought up whole city blocks and turned them into more casinos. And he busted any attempt made by his workers to be treated fairly. Also, he really loved movies in the 90s. He bought up all the fishing companies, devaluing the work and the labor of the fishermen and putting nearly half the city into poverty. Mark Desmond had a son, Roland, and when he died, he passed the blockbuster role onto him. Roland thinks his father was an idiot. For all he did, it wasn't nearly enough. And he's determined to take it all, to do more, to be 
better. In the comics, Roland and Mark Desmond are brothers, but I think changing that up a little bit to turn Blockbuster not into just a legacy mantle, but also a mantle passed down from father to son could be a super interesting parallel to what Dick is going through with his relationship with Bruce. Roland has spent billions buying up all the housing, building up more casinos, and turning Bloodhaven into a gambling town, destroying jobs and forcing people to gamble whatever earnings they have to try and pay rent. And worse, he started this media cycle and press junket in an attempt to get people to love him, and it's working. The people of Bloodhaven see him and his casinos as a way to pick themselves up from their bootstraps and become rich, just like him. The city is filled with massive screens that show his face and the propaganda that he's created. There's a figure in the shadows behind Montoya, and Robin steps out of the darkness. The two of them have met before a few times in Gotham, but they don't particularly know each other. Robin's been doing his own research on Blockbuster and his operation, and he wants to help take him down. He tries to talk to her the same way that Bruce talked to Commissioner Gordon. Dark and mysterious and from the shadows, but she just kind of laughs at him. He even tries to do the disappearing act that he's seen Batman do so many times, and he completely fails. She's like, listen kid, I know you got good intentions, but we don't need your help. We don't need any capes around here. Defeated, Dick goes back out on patrol, and he ends up coming across a robbery in progress. It's just a handful of guys. He and Bruce have taken out hundreds like them over the past 10 years. How hard could it be? He swings in to stop the robbery, once again trying his best Batman impression to intimidate the robbers, but they all just laugh at him, and a fight breaks out. At first, he's doing a good job, but because of the sheer number of them, Dick ends up getting overpowered. He's better than this. He was personally trained by some of the best fighters in the world, goddammit. He knows he's better than this. But he keeps on doubting and second-guessing himself, and without someone watching his back, he gets caught off guard. His staff even gets broken into two pieces during the process. I really like the idea of Dick not being as good of a fighter as he was when he was a kid, either because he's lost his touch a little bit or because of his own personal issues getting in the way. But that comparison to your younger self when you felt like you were better at everything and having to cross that threshold of being good enough as a kid to being great at something as an adult. I don't know, it's an interesting mentality that I think Nightwing could explore. He starts to regain his footing, taking out a couple of the robbers, but before he's able to turn the tides of the fight, a shadow drops down from above. No, not a shadow a bat. Batman stands in the alley. The remaining robbers stop dead in their tracks. They came to Bloodhaven specifically to avoid the bat. What the hell is he doing here? Which is crazy because Robin is thinking the exact same thing. With just a single glare, their bodies are filled with fear and the remaining robbers run away. Dick is furious and just absolutely lays into Bruce for showing up, and the two have an argument about it. Dick says that he had the situation handled, but like always, Bruce doesn't trust him. He can't even move to a new city to get away from him. He clearly only found him because he was spying on Dick through the GPS tracker in the Robin suit. It's literally Dick's first night out on his own, and Batman couldn't help himself. He has to get the last hit. He has to take all the credit, because that's who he is. A lot of people like Nightwing because they see him as this beacon of purity. He's like DC Spider-Man, not having the emotion emotional baggage of Batman, and he's the healthy member of the Bat family. But I think that's a little bit reductive. Dick Grayson is someone who does have a lot of angst and issues, especially in these earlier days when it comes to his relationship with Bruce. And it's not until he's able to grow and move on from that that he's able to be more of an ideal of hope. I'm not talking like Jason Todd or anything or going Titans levels of edginess, but that anger exists and he has to mature and grow out of it before he's able to be the best version of himself. But people always want to flanderize him down to just the funny one, which honestly is beat for beat exactly like Spider-Man now that I mention it. As the two of them are arguing, there's a sound behind Dick. One of the robbers that was on the ground stands up and tries to attack him from behind. Before Dick has a chance to react, Batman throws a battering at the robber's head, knocking him out cold. You're still sloppy. Come back to Gotham. He looks at Dick's staff, now broken in two, and you should fix that. Before grappling up to the rooftops, leaving Robin in the alleyway, defeated and alone. We pull back to a rooftop miles away. We see a figure draped in shadows, watching the two of them through a pair of binoculars. He talks into his earpiece, and we cut to Blockbuster on the other line, sitting in his office. The figure tells him that Batman is in town, along with Robin. It looks like the bat's leaving, but the kid seems to be here permanently, and he's sticking his nose in places he shouldn't. The figure looks at a cache of weaponry and asks his boss if he should take him out now, but Blockbuster stops him. Killing a superhero is just going to bring unwanted attention, especially Batman's kid, so just hold off for now and watch him from afar. Besides, things are already in motion. The little bird can try all he wants. He won't stop what's coming. We flash back to the Batcave eight years ago. We see Bruce sitting at the computer while Dick spars with a young Barbara Gordon who's just starting out as Batgirl. There's a rush of air and a figure enters the cave. Oh, that's crazy. It's a bird. Wait, hang on. No, it's a plane. Oh shit, it's Superman! Now, at the time of this video coming out, we don't have a ton of information on the direction of Batman and the overall Bat family in the new DC universe. The Brave and the Bold movie is going to feature Damian Wayne as Robin, as well as likely a lot of other supporting Bat family cast, including Nightwing. Damian's introduction is traditionally set a lot later than Dick becoming Nightwing, a whole three other Robins in between them. And when Dick was Batman, Damian was literally his Robin, and that's like a big part of their relationship. So it's a little tough trying to figure out where this movie and the Nightwing origin could fit into the timeline. So honestly, I'm just gonna ignore it and focus on telling the story how I wanna tell it. It's part of why I'm so excited for this new universe, because it seems like James Gunn is gonna be prioritizing the story over the canon. Maybe we could like open 
and it's Dick saying that it's his backstory or something. To, he's telling a story the whole time. I don't know. I would want Clark to be like a fun uncle for Dick. Someone for him to compare Bruce to and using that relationship to further drive a wedge between them later down the line. During this flashback, Superman tells Dick about the myth of Flamebird and Nightwing, two heroes from the city of Kandor who are eerily similar to the Batman and Superman of today. Dick becomes enamored with the story, specifically the Nightwing persona. Even when Superman is away, he would draw pictures and sketches of how he would want to bring that myth to life and take on that mantle, which Bruce would consistently shoot down and devalue. We cut back to the present and Dick sits on the rooftop of his apartment, overlooking the bright lights of the city. It's his first day here. He hasn't even finished unpacking his bags and he's already made a fool of himself. Maybe Bruce is right. Maybe this was a stupid idea. Maybe it's time to pack it up and go back to, there's a voice behind him. Do I need an invite to this bitty party or can anyone come? Dick looks back to see Barbara Gordon behind him. Just like Dick Grayson, Barbara is a character that I think has been grossly overshadowed when it comes to live action adaptations of the Batman mythos. We were so close to seeing her get adapted with the Batgirl movie and I think Leslie Grace would have done a fantastic job, but David Zaslav just had to be the worst ever and cancel it for a tax write-off and so now the entire movie is just gone from existence. Awesome. Love that. It would be great to bring Leslie back for this new universe, but I would also really like it if they cast an actual disabled actress to play her, because I think that Oracle is a far more interesting and special role for Barbara to play than just Batgirl. It gives her a place not just in the Bat Family stories, but also makes her a focal point of the overall DC universe. But most importantly, it shows that even though she's paralyzed and not out there punching bad guys, Barbara Gordon is still able to do a lot of good in the world, arguably more than she did as Batgirl. And so that's the story I'd want to go with for her in this movie. In the same way that this is a Nightwing origin movie, him trying to be better than Batman, it's also the origin for Oracle. At the start, maybe she still has a lot of trauma from what happened to her, and she misses going out in the field, and she feels quote-unquote useless now. And I'd want to see her take on this new role and come to realize it's where she was always meant to be, that she can be better than Batgirl. Dick and Barbara had kind of a thing back when they were younger, but like all of Dick Grayson's exes, they ended on good terms. I think whoever they end up casting for these two, the chemistry is super important. The majority of superhero movies, and movies in general if I'm being honest, have kind of lost their horniness, and we need to go back. Like, I'm talking the ending of Blue Beetle levels of steamy from them. I want people in the audience shaking in their boots. The two of them share a drink and they talk and Dick tells Barbara that he's scared. He's scared of this new life in this new city and he's scared that he's going to have to come back home a failure. And even worse, he's scared that he's never going to be able to leave Batman's shadow if he stuck as Robin. And that reminds Barbara, she didn't just show up in Bloodhaven for no reason. She hands him a box saying that she came with a housewarming gift from her and Alfred, made special based on nearly a decade of old sketches and drawings. He opens up the box to see a costume of black and blue. When it comes to the Nightwing costume, I don't really want to lean into the armor aesthetic that so many Batman costumes fall into. He's an acrobat, and I'd want the costume to reflect that a little bit. Honestly, they should take some cues from how they make the Spider-Man costumes. It should look and feel like a cloth that can breathe and move around. I'm not a huge fan of Red Nightwing, it's just not really my cup of tea mainly because I don't like shit in my tea. I'm kidding, the red does look cool and that new 52 run is really fun, but every time I see it, I just can't not think of this. If DC had any balls, it would be the disco wing design, but I guess I can settle as long as he has the finger stripes. And I'm kind of 50-50 on if he has the wingsuit like in the animated series. On one hand, he doesn't in the comics just using parkour and his acrobatics and his grapple gun to move around. But on the other hand, his name is Night Wing. Like, come on. Inside of the mask is a direct line to Barbara, who's able to see and hear everything Nightwing does, as well as monitor his vitals. She even thought of having a new code name. Oracle. I want her to be this present character throughout the story, sort of like how Lila was in Spider-Verse. She's always making comments and poking fun at him, and it's just kind of always there to bounce off of him. Barbara offers him a new staff, also made by Alfred. Dick takes a look at it, and back at his old one that's broken in two, and he declines it. Maybe he realizes that the staff was holding it back, that he'd be better and faster with something less bulky. Or maybe it's just because Bruce told him to fix it, and it's purely out of spite. Instead, he modifies his broken staff into a pair of electrified Eskrima sticks. They have a limited charge, so they're not like full-on tasers or anything, only really good for one or two jolts, but just just something in case of emergencies. Dick meets up with Montoya again in the new suit and asks to go by Nightwing. I think really funny if he was like, I thought you said you didn't want any capes in this town. You know, like a little joke because he doesn't, doesn't have a cape anymore. Against her best wishes, Montoya agrees to let him try his hand to take down Blockbuster. She wouldn't be involved officially, but she points him in the right direction. I mean, it's his funeral. You might be wondering why I chose Renee Montoya specifically for this, uh, since she's not necessarily a Nightwing character or anything. I just really like her. She rocks. She's the coolest. But also because I think introducing her here could be a good way to slowly have her grow disillusioned with the police and the role that she plays in that system over time before eventually quitting and becoming the question. Maybe we could do like a show that stars both her and Vic Sage's question. Maybe they fight the Riddler and we could call it question mark. <laughs> While the two of them talk and go over their plan, we pull back and reveal that the same mysterious figure is watching over them with a pair of binoculars. Reporting back to Blockbuster, again asking for permission to engage but still being told to wait. Nightwing starts to go after Blockbuster, finding evidence and taking down smaller crime rings that lead back to him. I sort of want to lean into this idea that he's still trying to be like Batman, but it's not really working. He's more confident than before, but still hasn't really become his full self yet. He's wearing this new black costume, got this cool name, is trying to lurk in the shadows, but he's still not able to strike that fear that he wants to. I want to go through this whole sequence in like a sort of montage
montage situation in my head i'm picturing it like that one sequence in the new ninja turtles movie and i know this sounds hyperbolic but trust me that is my genuine favorite scene in a movie ever made. It, it scratches an itch in my brain and I love it so much and every movie needs one like it. It's so cool. Anyway, he collects witness accounts, pictures, DNA evidence, whatever you can think of. He ends up discovering that Blockbuster has an entire warehouse of this strange substance, a mild toxin, not strong enough to harm a human being, but instead just small animals, like a pesticide. And he's not able to figure out why Blockbuster has so much of it. The entire time, the mysterious figure is watching him from a distance. And after it all, when Dick is confident that he's got enough evidence to put Blockbuster behind bars, nothing happens. He doesn't even spend a night in jail. He walks in and basically walks right out. Montoya says that Roland Desmond has all the cops in his back pocket and the DA and the judges. He basically even has the janitors on his payroll. The entire Bloodhaven Police Department is rotten down to the core and under Blockbuster's thumb. They hide it better, but it's no better than Gotham. It culminates in a standoff between Nightwing and Blockbuster as he's leaving the police station. This massive hulking figure stands over Dick, a physical presence that he has absolutely no chance of beating on his own. The two talk, but they don't throw any punches with all the witnesses around. Instead, they just exchange threats. Blockbuster Blockbuster laughs him off and walks away. Montoya makes it clear to Dick that basically the only way that they'll ever get Blockbuster for good is with a straight up confession. Or honestly, they'd have to pull an Al Capone and get him with tax evasion or something. But Dick makes it clear to Montoya that he's not giving up. It's all rigged and broken, but he's determined to put Blockbuster away. On the rooftops above them, the figure still watches through his binoculars. He reports this back to Blockbuster, that the kid isn't going to give up no matter what. And Blockbuster says, fine, but make it quiet. I don't want to deal with the press about it. The assassin pulls out a pair of swords, and as he steps into the light, we see his armor. You got that? Slade. Nightwing is a character that doesn't have a huge rogues gallery. I mean, Blockbuster is kind of one of the only big ones, but by far the most popular Nightwing villain is Deathstroke. He's so popular, DC tries to force him into more Batman shit to convince everyone that he's a Batman villain, but I think he's always worked better as a villain for Dick Grayson. A huge part of the reason why he's such a good villain for Nightwing is because of the two's dynamic. Slade Wilson fucking hates Dick Grayson with such a passion that it rivals Reverse Flash and Black Manta levels. He has such a deep, burning hatred for this guy. It's something that I would love to see get the proper treatment in the movies. And before you ask, no, we're not doing that for obvious reasons. I think it's better for everyone if we just, there we go. In this story, Slade would be a relatively minor character. Minor fuck, I shouldn't say that. Oh my God. I could have made him the main villain for this first movie or set him up with the credits for the sequel. But instead, I want to use this story to show the start of that relationship and build it up in a more organic way. An origin for Nightwing, Oracle, and now Deathstroke. The beginning of that feud show why Slade hates Nightwing so much. So we're meeting Slade at an earlier point in his career and setting the seeds of that relationship here. He even still has both of his eyes. Uh, that's not foreshadowing, I promise. We cut to Dick's apartment later that night as he's passed out asleep. In the darkness of the room, we barely make out Deathstroke's silhouette, blades in hand, watching over him. The Nightwing mask lays on the nightstand, the video feed still active. I like the idea of Deathstroke acting very similarly to Batman, using the shadows, being super fast and technical with his combat. It's part of what makes him such a great foil to Nightwing because he's basically a mirror image of his father figure. I guess making him like the Batman that kills is kind of like, is, is interesting for a Batman villain, but it's, I'm sorry, it's so much more interesting when it's Nightwing, like by like, a landslide. We cut to Barbara, who's at her tech support station that she's been at for the whole movie. It's pretty primitive, nothing too fancy, just a couple laptops, but it gets the job done. She catches a glimpse of the Nightwing mask feed and sees the figure looming in the darkness. It takes her a second, but she realizes what's happening, turns the volume up in his communicator all the way, and yells to warn him. Dick wakes up and just barely dodges the swipe at the sword, and he tries defending himself from the assassin. He doesn't recognize him at first, but then it clicks for him. Deathstroke, a top-level mercenary. Someone so dangerous that even Batman was scared of him. Bruce made him stay in the cave when it involved this guy, so he's serious business, which means... Blockbuster's scared. Dick puts on his mask to talk to Oracle, and he grabs his scream as to fight back, and their fight ends up leading out of the apartment building, across a series of rooftops, and into the crowded casino streets below. Deathstroke is good, maybe too good. Dick is barely able to hold him off. Deathstroke gets the better of him, pins him down, but before he can make the kill, something stops the blade. He looks up to see the Batman, using his gauntlets to deflect the sword away. Batman slams a punch into Deathstroke, sending him back a few paces, and in that opening, he grabs a hold of Nightwing and grapples them up to the Batwing as it soars over them. Dick stands up inside the plane, exhausted, and thanks Oracle for calling the backup. He doesn't like to admit it, but it's what he needed. But Barbara says that she didn't call for any backup. We learn that Bruce has been watching him the entire time, monitoring him even with this new suit. He's had a feed of the headset from the very beginning that Barbara and Alfred didn't know about. For the entire movie, he's been tracking him, spying on him. We flash back to the night Dick left the cave. He and Bruce are coming back from patrol, arguing once again. It started with something stupid. Bruce didn't trust Dick enough in the field to take down a villain by himself. But these feelings have been building for years and years, and it starts to get nasty. Both of them are saying things that neither of them really mean. Their words stabbing like knives. They're both too stubborn or stupid to admit it. And that stubbornness leads to Dick packing his things and moving out. We flash back to the present, and that fight continues. Dick says that Bruce doesn't care about him, that he never cared about him. He took him under his wing after his parents died, not out of the goodness of his heart, but because he just 
wanted a soldier for his war so that he would end up just like him. Bruce is quiet for a moment. He looks up at his son, takes off his mask, and puts his hand on his shoulder. So that you wouldn't. So many stories about Nightwing and Dick Grayson usually go about him leaving Batman in either one of two ways. It either frames Dick as some ungrateful brat who didn't know how good he had it, or Bruce as some piece of shit abusive monster who's terrible. And in most cases, it depends on which one's the main character and then they're the good guy. But very few are able to be realistic about that kind of relationship and falling out and never find that middle ground. Bruce Wayne, at his core, is a good person. He wants so desperately for his children to live the lives that he wasn't able to. But at the same time, he's a broken person with a lot of trauma and unresolved issues who runs around at night dressed up like a bat. And so a person like that trying to raise a kid, throwing a child into a mission in an obsession that's the result of an eight-year-old's tragedy is gonna leave some scars behind. Bruce Wayne is not a bad father, not by any means. It may seem like I was framing it that way, but I was just trying to show the perspective of Dick and I don't actually believe that. Bruce loves his kids and all the Bat family. But if you love someone, you have to show it. Intentions are great and all, you can have the best intentions of the world and want nothing but the best for someone, but if you never make it clear how you feel about them and never make them feel valued, then it doesn't matter and it might as well not exist. And so I would want the end goal of this dynamic, this wedge that's been driven between father and son, to be one that comes from Dick not understanding Bruce's intentions and Bruce not being willing to show that. And the two of them coming to understand one another and meeting in the middle to have mutual love and respect as adults and as a family. In that moment, it all becomes clear. The fights, the rules, the trust issues, it all makes sense. It was to protect him so that Bruce wouldn't lose his family ever again. Bruce Wayne is flawed, he's stubborn, he's overbearing, and he's broken. And it's gonna take a lot of time and effort to heal that. But he's a broken man who really does love him. He doesn't show it, but he's trying harder than ever right now. And Dick doesn't have anything to prove to him. He doesn't have to earn that love. He doesn't have to be better than him, better than Batman. He just has to be himself. He just has to be Dick Grayson. Batman and Nightwing put together that Blockbuster is going to be using the chemical that Dick found earlier and drop it into the water around Bloodhaven. Maybe we have a scene of the two of them working and fighting together to really show off how much they see each other as equals now and that's how they discover it. Thousands and thousands of barrels all being released within the hour. The poison may not be strong enough to have a serious effect on humans, but it could kill all the fish, ruin the ecosystem, and essentially destroy what's left of the fishing industry in the city. With the last legitimate industry gone, people would have no choice but to either work for Blockbuster or try their luck and gamble everything at his casinos. Everything that Blockbuster has been working towards. All the paid off cops, buying the fishing companies, everything. It's all been leading to this. Batman says he'll take the Batwing and stop the poison drops. And Dick interjects, saying that he wants to help, but Bruce stops him. He'll go deal with the poison while Nightwing takes down Blockbuster. There's not much hard evidence against him and it's probably not gonna be enough to put him away, but it's worth a shot. Bruce drops Dick off and as he flies away, he says, you got this. I trust you. Nightwing breaks into the city's biggest casino where Blockbuster's office is. Security is tight. Blockbuster knew that the capes would figure it out by now and so he's put out all the stops. Dick's able to sneak his way inside, but not before he gets caught once more by Deathstroke. With no Batman to save him now, he's ready for his rematch. The two of them fight their way all through the casino, and Dick is on more of an equal footing now. While this is happening, we see Batman in the Batwing, tracking down all the poison drops and putting a stop to as many as he can. See, if we had Aquaman around, he could probably help out, but he hasn't been confirmed for this universe yet, so Batman has to do it all on his own. Both Bruce and Dick are talking to Barbara at the same time, and she starts to get overwhelmed. She wishes that she could be there helping them as Batgirl, but instead she's stuck here. Barbara stops to calm down and takes a deep breath, and suddenly everything starts to fall in place for her. She can multitask, parallel process, focusing on nearly a half dozen things at the same time. Something she wasn't even able to do as Batgirl. Her mind is clear. This is where she's meant to be. She can do this. She's able to pinpoint all the chemical drops for Bruce to find, and at the same time, she pulls up a map of the casino. Dick can't fight off Slade forever, and she leads them into the vault to buy himself some more time. Deathstroke pulls out a gun and fires at Nightwing, who dodges just in time. The bullet bounces around the hard walls of the safe, ricocheting around until it returns to Deathstroke, hitting him right in the eye. With Deathstroke incapacitated for the moment, Nightwing locks the hired mercenary in a room full of money. They call that Irony, wink, wink, or I guess blink, blink in this case. As Dick traps Slade in the safe, we hear him screaming at him, cursing his name. It's fine though, I, that's not gonna come back to be a problem or anything, right? I just remembered Deathstroke in Smallville was so funny. He looked like he was, he was he looked like John McCain. Sorry, I don't know why I thought of that. Oracle tells Dick that Blockbuster's trying to make a break for it, escaping with a helicopter on the roof. Bruce is still focused on the chemical drops, so Nightwing has to face him alone. She tells him that Blockbuster's strength is too much for him. He's almost superhuman levels. And even if he beats him, they still don't have enough evidence to put him away. Dick thinks for a second, and he tells Barbara to get Detective Renee Montoya on the line. He has a plan. He fights his way out onto the rooftop as Blockbuster's making his escape. The crime lord looks at the ex-Robin and laughs. 
laughs. If he wants a fight, then he'll get a fight. Immediately, Blockbuster starts demolishing Nightwing. Barbara wasn't kidding about his strength. Dick tries to defend himself, but it's not enough. Blockbuster starts laughing at him, taunting him, saying that no matter what he does, he'll always keep on coming back. He starts to brag. Yeah, he poisoned the water. He killed more people than he can count. He even lies on his taxes. And still, he's untouchable. He spent his whole life proving that he's better than his father. And he's not gonna let some punk kid in a bird costume take it all away from him. The cops, the feds, not even the Batman can lay a finger on him. And trust me, kid, you're no Batman. Blockbuster slams Nightwing into the ground, squeezing his throat tighter and tighter. And with the last of Dick's breath, he's able to just barely say, Hey, you get all that? We hear Barbara's voice in his communicator. Loud and clear, baby. How about you, Montoya? Oh yeah, I think we got it. At that moment, all the screens around the casino turn on and display a video feed of Blockbuster's long, drawn-out confession. And same for the rest of the billboards all around Bloodhaven. All the people of the city look up to see Roland Desmond, the person that they put all their faith into, a criminal, all on the same screens that he used to manipulate them. You're right about one thing, Blockbuster. I'm not Batman but I don't need to be. With Blockbuster distracted, Dick puts his Eskrimas up against the crime lord's head. I just gotta be me, and that's enough. And he ups the voltage to the max, and I'm Nightwing. Electricity courses through Blockbuster's body, frying him, knocking him unconscious. Dick takes a second to breathe, and there's the sound of a jet engine. The Batwing flies overhead, and Batman drops down onto the rooftop, having stopped all the chemical attacks. Dick is like, you're a little late, but it's fine. I had it handled. There's a sound, and Blockbuster stands up and screams, running at Batman from behind. Before Batman is able to react, Nightwing throws one of his sticks at Blockbuster's skull, knocking him out cold. For real this time. Batman, please don't say it. You're getting sloppy. Blockbuster gets taken away and put into custody, not by the same corrupt cops that he's had on his payroll, but by the IRS of all people. And trust me, they are ruthless with him. The legacy of his criminal empire, given to him by his father, now reduced to nothing. Some time passes, and Renee Montoya is leading the efforts to help rebuild Bloodhaven. Barbara Gordon has fully taken on the role of Oracle, with a new high-tech base and helping out heroes around the globe. Nightwing and Batman meet on a rooftop as the sun rises over Bloodhaven, a new era for the city. Bruce Wayne offered to use his resources to help the city heal and bring it back to its former glory, but the citizens of Bloodhaven have had enough billionaire philanthropists for a while. They want to fix the city and heal on their own. And now, with Nightwing watching over them, they have the hope and are ready to do that. Bruce Wayne looks at his ward, the boy wonder, all grown up now, the light of the sun illuminating the city, his city. I'm proud of you, son. Dick Grayson looks back and smiles. Thanks, dad. I haven't made a video like this in a really long time. This video was supposed to come out in August, but I just kept pushing it and pushing it because I didn't think I was good enough. With every video I make, I always want to grow, learn something, do something different, find some way to be better. And so because of that, and because of how long it's been since I made one of these videos, I kept on pushing myself and saying, hey, when I come back, it has to be the best. It has to be better than ever. And then it ended up just kind of being daunting because of that. And honestly, I'm still not 100% happy with it. Maybe it's because of the character of Dick Grayson or because I just shut my ass up and made the video, but something clicked for me. I don't have to put these expectations on myself. I still want to make big projects and I still plan to, but not everything has to be that. Not everything has to be perfect. I don't have to always be better. I just have to have fun, do what I want to do, and be me. And I hope that's enough. Oh shit, wait, hang on, I forgot the credit scene. We cut to Dick's apartment, which is a mess after that first fight with Deathstroke, so Barbara's there to help clean up. You know, they had that bit of a fling in the past and it didn't work out, but who's to say they can't try again, you know? The two lean closer and closer to each other, and right before they're about to kiss, there's a knock on the door, and Dick gets up to go answer it. He looks at the person at the door and his jaw drops. Holy shit. Corey? All right, if this video does well enough, I'll make a Teen Titans video. I, I, just let this video do well, please. <laughs> anyway, thanks so much for watching, everybody. If you liked this video, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe. Special thanks to Anne's, Brandon Michael, Cabbage Boy, Cassidy, Calamari13, Carol Ann Brenneman, Cook C, Cosmic Tragedy, Dan the Dreamer Shill, Danny Boy, Deco PY, DJ Ricky08, Eden Kenna, Egan McFarland, Iron Ninja, Jake Salad, Corey's Not Fresh, Murn09, Pencil Fan, Tim Newfeld, Trans Huntress, Choices by Razor's Lane, Tyler Goodrich, Josh Kapoor, Zachary Stonebreaker, and Dear to Hero 148 for being spectacular fanboy on my Patreon. This has been Troy Boy 17 coming at you live. Happy New Year, and I'll see you around.